Hello, Bedford, and welcome to today's edition of Candidates Corner. I'm Sue Mullen, your host for today, and with me is State Senator Candidate Jean Deitch. Jean, welcome to Bedford and to BCTV. Thank you. Uh, Jean, you're running for State Senator in District 9. Can you tell me a little bit about that? What, where does District 9 actually lie? It's, there's more than Bedford. Well, it runs all the way from Bedford almost to the Vermont border, uh, Fitzwilliam, Troy, Rind, or, uh, um, Richmond. Yep. And how about, uh, have I heard, New Boston? Right. Uh, North to New Boston and, and south to Jeffrey. Okay. So that's quite a bit of distance to cover when you're out on the campaign trail. Indeed. All right. Um, Jean, in preparation for this interview, I have to be honest with you, I did not know an awful lot about your personal background, so I've done my research, and I'm going to ask you to share some information with us, and uh, hopefully I won't be playing Stump the Candidate, but who knows, <laughs> right? Uh, so Jean, tell me a little bit about your background. For instance, uh, I know you live in the Monadnock region now, but where did Jean Deitch hail from? Well, I came from a town which, uh, if you imagine Milford in the middle of miles and miles of cornfield, that's sort of uh, like the town in Ohio where I grew up. And it was so flat that if you saw a little rise off in the distance, it was an overpass. <laughs> not, not Mount Monadnock. <laughs> no. 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 And I think that's why I've always looked beyond. I've always been looking for What's out there? What's in the distance? What's what's going to happen in the future? How, how did your how did your parents play into that? Well, my parents uh, grew up in the Depression, so mm -hmm. even as very young children, we were taught to watch our pennies. And in mm -hmm. fact, my father's family lost their home uh, oh. when he was fourteen, mm -hmm. and he had to quit school when he was seventeen and go to work to support the family. And my mother. Um, she uh, had read every book in her little three-room schoolhouse, and mm -hmm. she said to her teacher one day, do you have any more books I can read? And her teacher said, no, but why don't you go to the library? And my mother said, what's a library? Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Okay, that's rural America. <laughs> that Indeed. Is rural. Yeah. But my, my parents did really well for themselves. They lived the American dream. My, my father... Um, uh, partnered in an agribusiness company that grew to a regional company. And my mother, um, she started school when I was, uh, college, when I was in fifth grade. And uh, I used to help her study. And we graduated the same year, I from high school and she from college. No kidding. What a monumental thing. And she became a teacher. Ah, fabulous. One of, <laughs> one of my kind. Yes. Um, so how did you end up coming to New Hampshire? Well. Um, we started out, um, my husband was studying in um, uh, Chicago? Oh, oh no. no. I, yeah, I started out in Chicago, yeah, before my husband. Okay. okay. I was studying All at right. Illinois Institute of Technology, that's right, mm -hmm. um, studying engineering graphics, and then um, I finished up school in Michigan, and that's where I met my husband, Bill. Okay. Um, and that is proof positive that when we married, I never expected to run for office because his last name is Kennedy. Oh, <laughs> now there's a missed opportunity. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but afterwards, um, we lived 12 places in 14 years. Mm. And then um, I sold my first company. Uh, we were in New York City sold it to um, one of the uh, companies that own Computer World and Info World. Mm -hmm. And I said to one of the executives there, you know, we're ready to settle down. We want to have kids. Right. Where right. should we go? Where should we move? And he said, oh, we have the cutest little town up in New Hampshire where we have dozens of computer magazines. There are all kinds of techies there. You folks would fit right in. No kidding. We moved to Peterborough huh. and lived there ever since, 34 years. I have to tell you, I've been in New Hampshire my entire life, and uh, that's a little known fact. I did not know that Peterborough was known for its tech business, uh, but all the better for having Gene Deitch move to the Monadnock <laughs> region. Um, all right, so you said that uh, when Bill was getting his PhD, you did some sort of uh, curriculum work or? 
Right. Uh, I started out my career in curriculum design while, uh, you know, to support us while mm -hmm. Bill was getting his PhD. And then uh, my first startup, I got into educational software. Ah. And uh, when I was 29, they promoted me to president of one of the affiliated companies, and I quadrupled sales there, sold it, and that's when we moved to New York City. Uh, I had to do a transition year there, mm -hmm. uh, and then on up to Peterborough. I, that, and we had kids in Peterborough. Right, um, two of them, I understand. Two, and mm -hmm. I stayed home with them for eight years. Mm -hmm. It was the joy of my life, mm -hmm. and I so strongly recommend to every young, young couple that um, they have kids. It's if such they, a joy. Yeah, and if, if they can, if they are, if they're fortunate enough to be able to spend time with them uh, and not have to go out the door every morning, then well, all the better. All but, the better. Right. Right. Yes. Um, so, what time period are we talking about here, Jean? When were you uh, moving to the New Hampshire and well into these tech businesses and? So I, I was going to go on with my career there. Mm -hmm. um, what what I did after. Uh, about the time the kids were getting into school, mm -hmm. the internet opened up to the public. So we're talking and 1990s maybe? Yeah, that was 94. Okay. And um, I looked online and I thought, there are no market research reports about internet e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And so I got together with an old partner and we wrote the first e-commerce market research report called Who's Succeeding on the Internet and How? Um, and it became a best-selling for a market research report. Um, and so I helped <clears throat> some other people get involved and move that f company forward. But my husband and I then got involved in robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, we partnered with a fellow and started the company that became Mobile Robots and built that into a global leader in research robots. So much so that we were like the Apple II of robots and, right, and Microsoft right. chose our platform to roll out the robotics studio software on. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Well, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, so after we sold that company, then we took a year off uh, and relaxed, and then I um, got a fellowship to Harvard mm -hmm. to get a master's in public administration, and Bill began teaching tech at the Dublin School. Okay. Um, I, l let me just ask a question aside, Jean. Uh, during this time, w were there a preponderance of women in the tech field? Were you alone? <laughs> were you, uh, what was that, what was that uh, landscape like? I was the only one in many, 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 many rooms. <laughs> right. I could tell you many stories about that. All right. <laughs> Maybe over a cup of coffee someday. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so how is it that these business enterprises have prepared you for state government? I mean, I know that you mentioned that you had companies, sold companies. Uh, what kind of change have you seen in the region? Well, you know, when when we sold the company, it wasn't until we sort of opened our eyes, you know, been working 60 and 70 hours a week, and we realized that the Monadic region had changed. Mm -hmm. You know, from going to be a global leader in computer magazines, it lost 40% of its manufacturing businesses and 90% of its publishing industry. Okay. And so at that point, uh, I looked around and saw that the people, the talent that had been involved in these enterprises had left. And so I started to try to attract back uh, those people mm -hmm. through a marketing program with the Peterborough Economic Development Authority. Um, I helped found Maxed Makerspace to mm -hmm. increase uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, oh, I've, I've been working a lot since then. Uh, we did uh, surveys of mm -hmm. the local businesses to find mm -hmm. out what their needs were and mm -hmm. then tried to match that up with educational facilities. Um, I've been working with Senator Kahn and the Public Utilities Commission to expand broadband, and then I'm trying to boost the sustainability uh, aspect of the community because that's so attractive to young people. Yeah, I know, Jean. Uh, t can you talk to me a little bit? You had an incubator business at Conval High School, oh. I believe. Yeah, we did. <laughs> which was quite a while ago and it was. very innovative for yeah. its time. That was the robot company. Okay. We, we went from uh, being a kitchen table startup to being the incubator at Conval mm -hmm. uh, to then having our own um, facility. And that also allowed you to, to sort of take an informal survey of what 
young people were interested in and how much enthusiasm was generated around that robot business, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, what made you decide that you were going to get into politics? Why run? Well, I realized that I was never going to be able to attract young people into mm -hmm. the Mananag region or into New Hampshire mm -hmm. uh, with the, because I'm fighting the actions by the legislature. You know, the legislature cut funding to universities, which caused tuition to store, soar and, and young people to leave the state. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had the opioid and the, and, and the rising level of suicides, you know, which mm -hmm. was harming the workforce and companies mm -hmm. couldn't find the workers they needed. Right, right. And then uh, we, we, the legislature then is, is um, downshifting taxes, causing property, uh, the expense, cost of living to rise. They refuse to raise the minimum wage, so we have the lowest minimum wage in New England. Um, they're taking all these actions which are making it difficult to attract young people, which is, is why we have the highest rate of young people leaving. And in addition, then by increasing the property taxes, they're f forcing our, our huge volunteer base of seniors and retirees, you know, the ones who keep our communities going, mm -hmm. many of them are having to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of high property taxes yeah. and the cost of living rising. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have described you, Jean, uh, to people who have asked me about you as being the hardest working political candidate <laughs> I have seen in a very, very long time. If, uh, if we have time at the end of this interview, I'd love to hear about some of the things that you've seen on the campaign trail. But we, you certainly have been a familiar face in Bedford for the past couple of years, or at least to me. Um, your campaign slogan, if there is such a thing, is smart with heart. Can you, can you expand on that a little oh, bit? Well, it's actually making New Hampshire smart with heart. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and and uh, to me, smart with heart means uh, when your head and your heart align, you know you're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so that's smart with heart. All right, so being able to take your business acumen and your ability to relate to people and what people need and what people are experiencing and taking that to state government is the goal at this point. Indeed. All right, uh, priorities once you get there? I think Should my priorities are very similar to yours. Mm -hmm. I, first of all, I think we both want to fix the education funding so that every mm -hmm. child in New Hampshire, regardless of zip code, mm -hmm. has access to a good education. Mm -hmm. And then we want to make it so that people can afford to live here mm -hmm. and attract families here by balancing the cost of living with the wages. That means bringing wages up and cost of living down mm -hmm. so uh, that we are more attractive. And, and uh, this is what our companies need. It is what our companies want more than anything. I'm sure you have heard stories about people working two jobs, three jobs, to try to manage the expense of raising families and that it's a tremendous struggle. Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, sometimes in Bedford we may lose sight of that, though not all of us lose sight of that, because there are, in fact, families right here in town that really are working copious hours trying to put food on the table. And I think that, you know, your attention to that detail is going to be well appreciated should you bring it to Concord next year. Um, you ran against Lee Nyquist the last time around mm -hmm. and lost by not a whole lot of votes. 79. So, <laughs> but who's counting, right? <laughs> but who's counting? Um, did you bring something different to this campaign than to, than to that one? Or is it just... Well, part of it is that people have gotten to know me better than right. I, then I, I think I canvassed for three months. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this time we've been canvassing for over a year and you right. know, thousands of people. So I think part of it is people have just gotten to know me better. Mm -hmm. um, I've uh, actually talked to some people who have been surprised to, to learn that you don't live in Bedford. 
because you... Some days I think I do. <laughs> yeah, me too, because, because you are uh, here, there, and everywhere. And uh, so that's actually been kind of amusing to have people yeah. say to me, wait, Jean Deitch doesn't live in Bedford? <laughs> I thought she lived here. Um, so uh, you won in the primary against two fairly well-known opponents, Mark Fernald and Bruce Fox. And now you are faced with running against the Republican candidate, uh, Dan Hines. Mm -hmm. Tell me what your thoughts are on that. Well, you know, we're very different in terms of experience and skills. You know, I'm a, a parent. I, I, um, uh, as a business person, I've put together budgets and business plans. I've uh, <clears throat> led projects and to a finish, made mm -hmm. things happen. Mm -hmm. um, I have, uh, I volunteer extensively in my community. Um, I have a master's in public administration from Harvard and I've studied economics. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know a lot about uh, Mr. Hines other than he's an attorney, an attorney and has represented Merrimack um, briefly before moving here in June. Okay. All right, so. Uh, but in addition, of course, uh, I, I think more importantly are, are what kind of bills would, mm -hmm. has he voted for versus what, right. I, how I would vote. And um, he has voted for bills that, um, for voucher bills that take money from public education. Um, he's voted for a number of bills that have this f the final result of increasing property taxes or not decreasing property taxes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so he's, he's, uh, he ignores the impact on property taxes of the bills that he votes for. Um, he has uh, voted against family and medical leave. Mm -hmm. uh, he votes against Medicaid expansion. Um, and he is... Um, he, he did not vote um, to require uh, use of biofuels, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which a bipartisan group just overrode the governor's veto on. Right, right. Uh, and it, it supports the lumber industry. It um, helps reduce our carbon footprint. And also- yeah, I certainly know a lot of people in the North Country were uh, happy that that veto yes. took place. But also our, our transfer stations are happy because mm -hmm. they, they use uh, biofuels are part of burning our trash. Right, so. right. So w it's a midterm election. Sometimes people look at midterm elections and wonder, you know, is this as, uh, as important as a year in which we're electing the president or state senators? Uh, tell me a little bit about your feelings about the importance of these midterm elections. Well, I don't think any of us has ignored the uh, dysfunction, shall we say, in Washington. And mm -hmm. we know <clears throat> that we need to send someone who will support sanity mm -hmm. uh, in Washington. And certainly Chris Pappas has a record of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but on the local level, I think we just have to say, no, no, Sununu, we are not going to vote for vouchers. Mm -hmm. He has said that vouchers are his top priority mm -hmm. when he's reelected, mm -hmm. you know, and if that's his top priority and he's got a legislature which is willing to follow that priority, mm -hmm. well, then we are going to end up with public schools that make it that much more difficult for us to attract back any families and young people that our workforce, uh, that our companies need for workforce. Uh, it's going to harm the children of, and it's going to raise property taxes. And so I think that whether you know you're looking at uh, the the governor, the exec council, the mm -hmm. senate, or or uh, your house races, mm -hmm. um, we have to keep that in mind mm -hmm. uh, that we need to say no, no. Yeah, and New Hampshire is uh, somewhat unique in the. Two year, the, the two year cycle really controlling everyone's lives in the electorate. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that we have the luxury in New Hampshire of being able to say, oh, it's just a midterm election. Uh, 
no. because our life basically is measured by, in two-year increments. And this one, while not a presidential election, as you said, I think is going to have uh, a, a major impact on the direction that we take in the State House. I applaud you for jumping back in again. Uh, it, it's not easy. Uh, Bedford, Jean, uh, as you well know, because you've been here so much, is a, a community that has diversity, not uh, to the extent that some of our surrounding communities might have. But can you tell me a little bit about how many, how many towns are there in District 9? 14. There are 14 towns in District 9. And is Bedford the largest community in that district? Bedford is 40% of the vote. So uh, it's very significant. Mm -hmm. um, but as you say, even in Bedford, um, you have many different levels of, pros of wealth, mm -hmm. um, though the median is very, very high. Yep. Um, and also deceiving when you assume or, f or when you assume that everyone is well off, or when you forget that in order to reach a median, somebody has to be yeah, on the yeah. lower end of the salary well, you, scale. As you well know, we have mm -hmm. 30 kids mm -hmm. who receive take-home boxes on the weekends right. to make sure they have food right. here in Bedford. Right. Um, and other towns in, in other parts of the region have many more. At Conval, there are 180. 180? Um, Take-home boxes on the weekend? Yes. Wow. Wow. Uh, and Conval is not the highest by far. Mm -hmm. So um, it, uh, to me, it's appalling that we have children. With food insecurity, I believe that's, that's the term that we're, we're using. Uh, yeah. Uh, how about the smallest community? What is the smallest community in in? Oh, well, the smallest District community Nine. is Richmond, mm -hmm. uh, which is on the very far western end. Um, it's, a, it's a very rural community, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it, it, we have everything from uh, communities that are well-off uh, rural communities um, whose major interests may be environmental, mm -hmm. or um, there are, it, it is a very old um, district, mm -hmm. as most districts mm -hmm. in New Hampshire mm -hmm. are. So fixed people on fixed incomes are a very big part of uh, the constituency here. Yeah, it's interesting when you talk about uh, the communities having different interests. I actually hadn't thought about that very much. Uh, but yeah, you would have to be a bit of a Jacqueline of all trades, <laughs> if you will, in, at least in terms of your knowledge and your own interest areas to be able to represent such a diverse constituency. Fortunately, I've always had very broad interests, mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, when you knock thousands of doors, you learn right. about every, uh, every type of uh, person. You see every type of house, um, and you see all the different... Jean, uh, talk to me a little bit about that door knocking, yeah. because uh, I believe that you have been knocking doors in this race for well over a year. Am I correct in that? Yes. How many days a week? How many hours a day? What, I, I, how, did, how did you put yourself on a schedule? Uh, yes, uh, sometimes I wonder what I'm going to do when I stop. You know, I may just go around and start knocking people's doors. <laughs> right, right. Well, hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully if you're elected, that will take up a significant portion of your time. But, uh, but it's good because you get to know people. Um, well, last year it, it was not nearly as heavy a schedule, but mm -hmm. um, uh, right now we are knocking seven days a week. And can you give me a, an estimate? How many doors do you think you've knocked on? Oh, well, uh, we could look up that number, but it's well over 2,000. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. I, I know myself, because I, too, am in the midst of door knocking season, uh, that it is unpredictable in terms of whether or not you're going to spend two minutes with somebody or 20 minutes with somebody. So the idea that you're up in the thousands of households mm. that you've knocked on, I think, speaks to your commitment to being willing to sort of hang in there and get to know as many people as you can. Um, we've shared experiences at the transfer station. 
Yes. And Indeed. that's a little bit like the wild, wild west in Bedford <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you're up there on a Saturday afternoon. But uh, have, have any of your experiences surprised you? Have you, uh, have you been welcomed with open arms? Have people been skeptical? What, what kind of a response have you been getting? Well, obviously different people are different, but mm -hmm. uh, this is on the final camera. It's looking at me now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, you can look right into it. Oh, um, well, I I, uh, I think that some sometimes people um, welcome you with open arms, and then sometimes they uh, would rather not see you. But I think there's certainly a different willingness to listen now mm -hmm. um, that may not have existed before. So I can walk into a house that I, I'm not a terribly partisan person, and that's the first thing I tell everybody. And I'm a business person. I'm here to get things done. I, I, I'm not here for the red team or the blue team. But um, I, well, I, think I, I think that's people a good, are willing it's, it, to it, talk and to listen because they want to see something happen. They desperately want to see somebody who can lead us out of this mess. So if you don't mind, Jean, then I'm, I'm going to do a little uh, canvassing screen test on you and ask <laughs> you to uh, look into the camera and tell us why, in fact, we should vote for Jean Deitch and uh, what you hope to see happen on November 6th. So feel free to look right into that camera and tell us why. Well, this election's not about me. You are the ones who have the power. And think, what are your children and grandchildren going to ask 10 or 20 years from now? What did you do, Grandma or Dad? Why did you not act more strongly than you did? So I say volunteer. Make sure every absentee ballot is in. Bring your neighbors and your friends and your friends of friends to the polls, and we can escape this darkness. All right, well, Jean, those, those are lofty goals to have, and I wish you the best of luck. Um, election day is November 6th. We will be at the polls from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. and hope to see as many voters as possible. As Jean mentioned, absentee ballots can be had through the town clerk should you be unable to attend on November 6th. And on to the election. The best of luck, Jean.